Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a nifty new disc of music by someone you've probably not heard of. His name is Melcher Melchers. See that? There it is, Melcher Melchers. Actually, his real first name was Heinrich, but apparently he went through his life as Melcher Melchers. Don't ask me why. So he was born in 1882, and he died in 1961. He was a Swedish composer who spent most of his career teaching composition at the Royal Conservatory in Stockholm, but his orientation was sort of French, kind of sort of French, which I always enjoy. There's a whole series of Scandinavian composers who, instead of looking to Germany um, for their for their inspiration, for their models, looked toward France. And some of the Frenchies were, especially in Finland, were people like Uno Klami, who was one of those, Aulis Salonen, and they're a wonderful bunch of composers because French composers tend to, tend to have a, a certain, first of all, uninhibitedness when it comes to writing, even music in traditional forms, and also a wonderful clarity and vividness of orchestration and a feeling for craftsmanship that some of the German guys just don't have. They tend to be kind of fusty, you know what I mean? And fustiness is, you know, who needs fustiness, especially in second tier composers who no one's ever heard of. So so it's good to make his acquaintance and you hear the Frenchosity in this music rather clearly. We have three works here. First is a tone poem called La Kermesse, which is based on the Rubens painting. The Kermesse is, of course, a festival, often associated, often a church festival, but generally speaking, a popular festival with people running around and games and stuff and whatnot. And that's what you hear in this piece. It's like the Carnival Overture or something like that, spread out to 13 minutes. And you, you already get a sense of what this guy's like. His, his inspiration, his musical inspiration, tends to come in short, highly contrasted bursts that he kind of welds together in a mosaic-like tapestry. Uh, the orchestration, as I said, is extremely vivid. There's lots of percussion and banging and smashing, cute little comic interludes, and, and it, it's vivid and charming and fun to listen to. The next work is another tone poem called Elegy, from 1919, Kermes says, from 1920. It was written in memory of the composer's mother. Um, it is a completely uneventful. I mean, it's an elegy, of course, you know, somber, soft. Um, it's almost 11 minutes long piece of music. I, I found it a, a bit too static for my taste, even though it's elegiac. I mean, it does what it's supposed to do, right? But it 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 doesn't go anywhere. And because his he, his melodic style wasn't particularly long-breathed, you come away wishing that it just had a tune, a really good tune. It has chorales. He liked chorales and other things, but I, it didn't convince me. I think it just sort of lays there. And then finally, the big number here is the Symphony in D minor, Opus 19. Now, Symphony in D minor in France, or a French style composer, is going to evoke that of César Franck, and so it does. It has three movements, like Franck's symphony. It starts in an ominous minor key and then ends happily, although it doesn't have like a long introduction in the first movement. It's it, happily, happily, it's not a mere imitation. Not at all. Melcher's style was a little bit too, too personal for that. Even though it doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't have a, a big tune anywhere. And you do wish for it. You really do. Um, because it's tonal, it's conservative music, it's slightly chromatic, although not as systematically chromatic as Franck, I think. It's it, it, it's an interesting work, because it doesn't really sound like anybody else. It's exuberantly scored for a large orchestra, for a symphony, a French symphony of that period. It does use cymbals and triangle, it's got some percussion whacking around in it from the first movement yet. So it, it doesn't sound inhibited. Um, and it's in each, the outer movements anyway, are in perfectly strict sonata form. So although the thematic material isn't that, isn't that automatically attractive or appealing, um, it is distinctive and you hear it very clearly when it comes back in the recapitulations, how it's getting developed. It's an easy symphony to follow. 
And it doesn't sound stiff in its treatment of form. It really, really doesn't. But these sort of herky-jerky motives that he uses, big contrast between a loud thing, then a soft phrase, then a loud phrase, then something that goes somewhere else. I mean, who knows? It could even remind you a little bit of a neurotic French Bruckner believe it or not. But the performance is very, very good. The performances are marvelous. They're with the Gavla Symphony Orchestra under Jaime Martin. And they're beautiful and wonderfully well recorded by Ondine. Uh, this is a fun disc for those of you who like to explore unusual composers, people we haven't heard of, um, and music that's worth getting to know. At least the, the first tone poem, Caramessa, and the symphony are definitely worth hearing. Whether you'll want to hear them frequently is something that you would have to answer for yourself. But I was happy to make his acquaintance. The symphony was recorded before, by the way, um, along with his second piano concerto. He wrote a couple piano concertos, violin concerto. Not a huge output, apparently, but um, some major works. And it would be good to have them available once again so we could get to know him even better. Sounds like a personality. Maybe not a major personality, but a personality. And at the end of the day, that's kind of what matters. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.